The marine environment is a rich and largely unexplored reservoir of biodiversity with vast potential for food, health and biotechnology. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre, EMBRC, is a research infrastructure which aims to unlock the knowledge and innovation potential of our oceans. It enables researchers and companies to access marine organisms, expertise and experimental facilities to study them. Headquartered in Paris, EMBRC brings together 45 sites in nine member countries. We provide access to specialist facilities and services that enable researchers from academia and industry to study marine life and develop innovative solutions to address societal challenges like climate change and health and food sustainability. We support both fundamental and applied research, particularly for areas like biodiscovery, biotechnology, aquaculture, biodiversity and climate change research. EMBRC supported research has already led to novel, high impact research in human health, product and medicine development and aquaculture, and it's helping us to fully grasp the crucial role of ocean life. EMBRC has benefited hundreds of researchers across Europe and beyond, delivering robust and efficient services and expertise to help users obtain the best possible results. So EMBRC is continuing to develop its services. We're working to start recording biodiversity at many of our sites using molecular techniques to put in place so-called genomics observatories. This will allow us to have a much better understanding of how our oceans function and their current health. In addition, we're increasing our bioprospecting capabilities to better support the development of new products and solutions from the sea. EMBRC is a single access point to remote and on-site services in Europe, supporting marine research and innovation across borders. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Assemble Plus Conference, Marine Biological Research at the Frontier. It is my pleasure to introduce you for the talk today, Dr. Chris Boller. Dr. Boller completed his PhD at Ghent University in Belgium in 1990, followed by postdoctoral studies at the Rockefeller University in New York. In 1994, he received a Marie Curie Fellowship and established his own research group working on higher plants and marine diatoms at the Station Zoologique Anton Dorn in Naples. And in 2002, he took up the current position in Paris, where he's director of the Recherche, direct, director de Recherche Classe Exceptionnelle at the CNRS, and is the head of the Plant and Algal Genomics Laboratory at the Institut de Biologie de l'École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Dr. Baller has been an EMBO member since 1995 and was the recipient of the CNRS Silver Medal in 2010 and the ERC Advanced Grant in 2011, a Grand Prix Scientifique from the Louis, Found Louis D. Foundation uh, in 2015. He was also a Grass Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University between 2016 and 17, and was elected to the French Academy of Agriculture in 2018. He has published over 230 articles, most of which in high-ranking journals, including Nature Science, PNAS, and so on. He has a Scopus H index of 73 and around 25,000 citations. Several of his articles have received more than 1,000 citations. His main research interest is the understanding of the response of plants and marine diatoms to environmental signals through functional and comparative genomics. He is one of the scientific coordinators of the Tara Oceans project to explore the biodiversity, ecology, and evolution of plankton in the world's oceans. And today, we are precisely going to hear about the Tara Oceans ecosystems biology at planetary scale. I take the opportunity to thank Chris for agreeing to participate in the Assemble Plus conference and given the opportunity to be part of the Tara project, Scientific Adventures. The lecture will be followed by questions and answers. Please keep your microphone switched off so that the questions and answers follow an orderly progression. Please place your questions in the chat. After the questions in the chat, we'll ask you to verbalize the question. Thank you, Chris, again, and please go ahead. Thank you, Adelino. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and um, do I need to share my screen? 
again? Yes, yes. You please share the screen. Okay. That should be here. Okay. How is that? That looks That's good. fine. It's just a laser you need to set to. Oh, it's there already. Uh, yeah, good. Okay. You can start. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't know if it's good afternoon for some of you or even good evening. Um, uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, for me, it's the morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the Tara Oceans project um, and what we've been doing within this project to try to use a sort of systems biology approach uh, to understand marine ecosystems um, at global uh, scale. So. As Adelino mentioned, um, I work at the CNRS um, in the Institut de Biologie de l'École Normale Supérieure uh, in Paris. Um, although I've been around in Europe for quite a while with a PhD in, uh, in Belgium and uh, a degree in the UK and, um, and also worked for 10 years in, uh, in Italy at the Stazione Zoologica where I really, uh, um, that was really my initiation into the marine world um, and was extremely important for my, uh, for, for what I did subsequently. So, um, let's see if I can move forward. Um, there seems to be a problem. Okay, all right, let's see. So, um, I'm going to talk to you about the Tara Oceans project then. Um, quite an unusual project um, uh, because a lot of the work was uh, was done on a, on a research sailboat, at least during the first uh, four years of the program, um, which is now 10 years old. Um, so we began with a four-year expedition. Um, the aim of Tara Oceans, as you will see uh, from the scientific uh, point of view, was to explore marine planktonic ecosystems and learn more about um, their sensitivities to climate change um, uh, and other environmental changes in today's ocean. Um, the, the science was obviously the most important component um, as far as I was concerned, uh, but, the, uh, uh, but we also had a lot of activities around the popularization of science around science education um, at primary, uh, secondary school level, um, and also towards influencing governance of the ocean uh, through regular dialogues with, with policymakers, uh, which is now continuing as part of the UN decade of ocean science, as you can imagine. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of these non-scientific aspects today, but you're welcome to, to ask me any questions about them later. Um, these aspects were particularly important um, because the Tara Oceans project was supported um, first and foremost by the Tara Ocean Foundation, um, uh, who owned the Tara sailboat, um, which you can see here on the on the top right. Um, Tara is a 36 meter sailboat um, adapted for research, um, but obviously we cannot do the kinds of uh, uh, very uh, um, fine level sophisticated oceanographic research that, are, that is possible on the, on the larger oceanographic vessels. Um, so already we were constrained by, by what we could actually physically do on a small research platform such as Tara. Um, but we had six scientists on board at any one time and those six scientists were, were very much uh, integrated in performing always the same operations on board throughout this four year program. Um, we went around the world twice, um, as you can see on the map here. Uh, uh, first of all, throughout uh, the different oceans of the world, um, the Indian Ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And then in 2013, we went around the world again, but this time around the Arctic Circle, uh, going through the Northeast Passage and the Northwest Passage um, in the same season, in the same year. Uh, which was actually Tara was the first uh, uh, sailboat to go around, go through both of these uh, Arctic passage, passages uh, together in the same year, which today sadly is possible because of uh, because of uh, melting of the ice in the Arctic, um, and um, uh, it's actually not so difficult anymore, at least during the during the summer months. Um, uh, before I move on, I should also acknowledge uh, um, uh, the, the institutional support um, uh, for the project, which was coming from EMBL, um, the CNRS, 
EMBL in Germany, based in Heidelberg, the CNRS in France, and the CUR, in particular, the Genoscope uh, uh, Institute, which, which performed all of the sequencing, which enabled all of the work that I'm going to talk to you about. And uh, 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 last but not least, Eric Carsenti, who was the scientific vision behind this program in the first place, uh, uh, was the scientific director um, up until up until this year. So thank you to Eric and to all the others who made this work possible. So um, as, as, as always, through um, scientific um, exploration of the oceans um, since the last centuries, we have we've used different lenses uh, to try to un uncover different aspects of the ocean. Um, back in the early days of ocean exploration, um, we the general feeling was that, was that the oceans were, were largely devoid of life, except for the fish for the fish that could be seen, the whales and so on. And in fact, the sailors had big uh, big questions about you know what what on earth do, do these organisms eat? There's nothing to eat. There's no grass. There's no meadows uh, to to feed the uh, uh, the food chain. So several centuries ago, there were these issue questions around you know what what is life in the ocean? Um, and, and a general idea also was that um, there is no life in the deep ocean. The deep ocean was azoic, uh, meaning devoid of life. Um, this idea was finally shattered in the 1870s uh, by the HMS Challenger expedition, um, which was the first truly oceanographic expedition, which we, we would call today big data, uh, big science, right? The Challenger was the first uh, in the 1870s, and over subsequent decades up until today, uh, we have continued oceanographic exploration. We have developed um, uh, increasingly more sophisticated tools to explore the ocean, uh, uh, often accompanied by satellite imaging from space. Um, and also um, a network of, uh, of, of, of buoys that are out in the ocean taking data and, and, and so on. So um, uh, this has allowed great insights into how the ocean works um, over, over the centuries, in fact. Um, now, the, the lens that we wanted to look through um, in the Tara Oceans expedition uh, was specifically focused on the plankton, planktonic organisms, um, which we can define as the invisible multitude of life in the ocean, if you like. They, they may be small uh, and invisible to the naked eye, but they're in fact incredibly important and uh, also quite abundant in terms of biomass. If we take all of the biomass in the ocean, basically we look where the carbon is found in life in the ocean. Um, we come to the realization that this microscopic world of organisms, in fact, uh, is, is, uh, uh, accounts for about two thirds of the biomass in the ocean. The other one third are, are, are fish and dolphins and whales uh, and, and so on, things that you typically see associated with ocean life uh, uh, on TV. Uh, but in fact, the majority of biomass in the ocean is in this microscopic invisible world. Um, so it's small, microscopic, but in fact, uh, these organisms are incredibly important. Um, first of all, they are the, the basis of pretty much all oceanic food webs. So if there is no plankton, there is no, no food for uh, the larger organisms to eat. Um, a lot of that food is generated through uh, um, uh, photosynthesis, um, which takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, converts it into organic biomass in the ocean uh, uh, within these microscopic plants in the ocean known as phytoplankton. Um, and these provide the, uh, the, the, the food for, 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 for the ocean food webs. Uh, through photosynthesis, these organisms also generate oxygen. Um, the amount of photosynthesis in the ocean is uh, uh, essentially equivalent to the amount of photosynthesis on land. So even though we cannot see plants in the ocean um, to, uh, to a global extent, um, these microscopic uh, phytoplankton are as important for the functioning of, of our planet as are, as are the plants and the trees on land. Um, these organisms also participate in the biological carbon pump, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, and through this um, movement of carbon through the carbon cycle, and sometimes sequestration of carbon into the ocean, into the ocean interior, 
uh, uh, these organisms can affect climate. Uh, they have affected climate in the past during the history of life on Earth. And they're also uh, affected by climate change. Um, so these were the reasons that we wanted to try and study these, these organisms in more detail in, in the first place during Tara Oceans. Um, the way that we studied them uh, was using uh, extremely standardized um, pipelines, uh, both for collection of the organisms and for analysis of the organisms. Um, so a lot of the time during the project was in fact spent just doing the same thing, okay? So it was really quite monotonous, um, uh, but that ultimately generated the rich data set that, that I'll introduce you to uh, uh, later on. So on board, um, Tara, uh, most of the activities were uh, spent on collecting uh, plankton samples from the seawater. Uh, we had different ways to collect uh, seawater, either using plankton nets, which we would tow behind Tara, or using a peristaltic pump, which we could pump uh, water from down as deep as about 80 meters or so um, in the water column. And then we also deployed a CTD rosette, uh, uh, which we could deploy down to a thousand meters and collect seawater samples from as deep as a thousand meters in, in, in the Niskin bottles. Um, once we collected those water samples, uh, we fractionated them by size uh, because these planktonic organisms have different sizes um, going from the smallest organisms, smallest um, uh, uh, components, uh, 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 the viruses, which can be as small as 20 or 30 nanometers, up through the bacteria, which can be a few microns, uh, through the protists, which can be a few tens of microns, um, up to the zooplankton, uh, which can be up to several millimeters of, in size. Um, so all in all, we are going through several orders of magnitude here. Um, and there is no single plankton net that you can just use to scoop up all of these plankton to analyze them. So the, the, the size fractionation was very important uh, here and also allowed us to sort of simplify uh, uh, the system and break it down uh, into its components, which I think was, was also very important for uh, um, allowing us to, to learn more about these communities from analysis of these samples. Um, once these samples were collected on board the ship, um, they were um, uh, sent back to the participating laboratories and were submitted to genomics analysis uh, 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 in Geniscope in, in Paris. Uh, through these approaches, we would do meta barcoding to characterize the organism communities. We would do metagenomics, just sequencing all of the DNA in the samples. And we would do meta transcriptomics to sort of see the active component of genes present in any community. So all of that happened uh, 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 on one side and on the other side, uh, we also spent a lot of work actually doing morphological analysis uh, to see what the organisms actually look like because this provides you with a three dimensional view of the organisms rather than the, the, the one dimensional uh, view that you get from, from DNA based uh, studies. All of this was aimed at uh, uh, answering the simple question of with, within these plankton communities in a given location, um, who is there, uh, what do they do, with whom do they do this, and, and why is it important? Why is it important for them? Why is it important for the ecosystem? Uh, uh, why is it important for, for us, for the functioning of the Earth system uh, as, as well? So this is our standard pipeline, which we applied throughout the project. Um, we have now sort of five, five years post um, expedition. We've, uh, the, as a consortium, there's over 20 labs involved in the project internationally. Uh, we ourselves have published uh, uh, over 130 publications uh, during the five years since the project and the expedition ended. Uh, uh, many of these in high-level journals uh, uh, in which we're also happy to get the, uh, the front covers in, in some cases. Um, the first splash that we made was in 2015 uh, uh, in a special issue of Science uh, dedicated to the, to the project on May 22nd, 2015, um, uh, in which they, they kindly gave us the front cover, they gave us the editorial, um, and, and in this um, uh, special issue, we published five papers back to back uh, describing some of the first results from, from the project. Um, 
in those five papers. Um, in one of them, we reported a collection of around 40 million genes uh, coming from around 35,000 uh, prokaryotic taxa, so bacteria and archaea. The majority of these 40 million genes are new and uh, with unknown function. Um, concerning the viruses, we reported around five and a half thousand different types of viruses in another paper, um, only 39 of which were previously known before the project. Um, and concerning the, the single-celled eukaryotes, or uh, the protists, um, we described around 130,000 genetic types of protists. Um, this represents uh, more than 10 times the number of formally described species of marine eukaryotic plankton, and around one third of them cannot be assigned to any known taxonomic group, so we have no clue actually what, what, what they are. Okay, so all of this illustrates the incredible discovery uh, um, that is possible uh, uh, when, when exploring um, uh, ocean ecosystems, clearly. Um, since these uh, uh, founding publications, um, we published another paper a couple of years ago where we described a global ocean atlas of eukaryotic genes. Uh, so to add to the 40 million prokaryotic genes, we reported a collection of 116 million genes from eukaryotes. Okay. We also reported single cell genomes from uh, more than 900 diverse different uh, uncultured uh, yet abundant protists in the environment, uh, which is another important resource. Um, and then more recently, last year, uh, we reported um, uh, around 200,000 types of viruses now, um, including from the Arctic Ocean. So going from our initial description of five and a half thousand types of viruses, we're now up to about 200,000. And now finally, we begin to see the curve saturating so this 200,000 figure is, is a sort of baseline figure for the actual total number of viruses, at least in the, in the upper uh, 1,000 meters or so of the ocean. Um, this is just for DNA, double-stranded DNA viruses, okay? There's another world of RNA viruses and single-stranded DNA viruses, which we haven't yet uncovered. So all of this sort of is a summary of the resources that we generated from, from the project, um, the, the stamp collecting. Uh, uh, aspect of the project, if you like. Um, now it's important to try and do something with this with this data and to try to reveal some new information. Um, some of the very basic surprises that emerged from, from this data set. Um, I'm gonna tell you about two of them concerning this, this new world of marine protists, of single-celled eukaryotes, which are distributed throughout the eukaryotic tree of life, um, as you see in this eukaryotic uh, uh, representation here on the right. Um, and so one very simple question that we can ask is, which is the most abundant group of plankton in the ocean? Very simply, uh, what is the most abundant? I'll let you think for a second. I'll take a glass of water. The most abundant group of plankton in the ocean turn out to be um, groups of radiolarians. Um, known as Colodaria and Theodaria. These turned out to be unexpectedly abundant. Um, these are fairly fragile organisms, and we could only really uh, see them thanks to in situ imaging of organisms that we did uh, uh, of these giant protists in the, in the global ocean through work led largely by Fabrice Knott uh, um, in Roscoff. So these organisms, we knew that they were present in the ocean, but we hadn't really appreciated their abundance um, before Tara Oceans took a look at them. So that was uh, concerning the most abundant organisms in the ocean. Um, what about the most diverse group of organisms? Um, also important for biodiversity reckoning, right? Uh, which do you think is the most diverse group of protists in the ocean? Um, you probably most of you will be surprised to know that the most diverse group that we found uh, were um, uh, organisms known as diplonemids. Um, what on earth are diplonemids? You may well ask. Well, they uh, uh, diplonemids are sitting down in the eukaryotic tree of life in this group uh, known as the dischychristates. Um, this group 
they're fairly obscure organisms, but some of them are extremely important human pathogens. Uh, trypanosomes are in here, uh, leishmania are in here. And so although uh, we have very little information about what diplonemids are um, and what they're doing in the ocean, um, uh, 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 the fact that they are the most diverse um, organisms in the ocean now uh, pleads that uh, we need to study these in, in, in more detail and groups um, such as Patrick Keeling's lab on the one side and Julius Luca's lab in um, Česka Budjevica in the Czech Republic are actively studying these organisms now um, following this very empirical result. So these are just two of the simple questions that you can ask once you have this large data set. Um, the other thing that you can do, um, uh, since we have information about the communities of different viruses, different prokaryotes, and different eukaryotes in this invisible world, we can put all of that data together from all of the different sampling sites that we looked at, and we can do a giant compute and sort of try and divine the social network of the plankton, uh, the, the ocean's Facebook, if you like. Who interacts with who? Uh, why do they interact with each other? And, and, and so on. So this was uh, actually a very large compute um, that was done uh, several years ago, led by Jeroen Race in, in Belgium. Um, and this is the, the, the hairball which emerges from uh, this study, basically an integrated network of networks that defines, that, that, that illustrates this plankton interactome. Um, each dot here represents a different kind of organism, be it eukaryote, bacteria, or archaea in this case. And green lines between them um, uh, uh, represent co-occurrences of these organisms. And red lines between organisms uh, represent um, uh, uh, exclusions or absence of, uh, of, of co-occurrence, if you like. So from, from this study, um, uh, it's, it's not very nice to look at, but if you tease this apart and you look at sort of the importance of taxon-taxon associations versus taxon environment associations, um, we could see from this very clearly, in fact, that, that biotic interactions were more important than abiotic interactions. Um, in structuring this uh, um, this interactome, so this is perhaps important for you know people interested in studying top down versus bottom up influences on plankton ecosystem structure. This tells us that, that the biology is in fact the, the appears to be more important than the abiotic environment in which these organisms live. So basically, it's more important who you live with um, than where you live. Okay, we were quite surprised to see that, but but that result is actually quite uh, um, uh, uh, quite robust uh, from 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 this analysis. Um, something else that you can do with this data set, uh, with this interaxome, is you can go in and you can look for your favourite organism, uh, which may be one of these blue dots, and you can prize apart what it interacts with or what doesn't it interact with to help you learn more about the the ecology of of the, of the organisms that you work with. Um, so this kind of work is very much facilitated by the imaging um, that we also performed in parallel with the, uh, uh, with the DNA sequencing work. Um, so we established um, in particular in, in the EMBL, which are very well known for their cell biological, cell biology expertise and resources. Um, uh, we set up a sampling program, uh, Sebastian Collan and Columban de Vargas in particular, uh, set up a sampling um, and analysis pipeline, which allowed us to uh, uh, visualize millions of organisms uh, from the plankton um, at the same time and generate very detailed images of, of what they look like. Um, here are three examples of different single-celled um, protists. Uh, where you can see their external structures and as well as their internal structures um, labeled with different dyes. And in each case, um, in the top left, we have an acantharia. In the top right, uh, we have a dinoflagellate. And in the bottom, we have a diatom. Um, and in each case, you can see their exquisite exoskeletons um, composed of different uh, minerals. Or, or organic material in the case of the, the dinoflagellate, as well as seeing the internal structures like the chloroplasts, like the nucleus, 
uh, where the DNA is found and so on. Um, so this is fantastic information uh, to couple with the genomic information uh, to help us learn more about this uh, this invisible world. Um, what this uh, technique can do, obviously, is also reveal interactions between the organisms. Um, and I, I think really seeing is believing when you see a, a line between two organisms in the interactome hairball, you may not necessarily believe that they're interacting with each other, which are, after all, generated computationally in silico. Whereas when you actually see organisms interacting in the microscope, um, I think you're more inclined to believe the, 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 the information. Um, so this is one example on the left with a, a chain of diatom cells um, in the background uh, being infected by a ciliate known as vorticella. Uh, uh, very dramatically in, in this example here. Um, and on the right, we have an example of um, a chain of diatom cells um, containing nitrogen-fixing bacteria within the cells. Uh, so rather than being uh, sticking to the outside, in this case of the diatom chain, um, these nitrogen-fixing bacteria are living inside uh, the cells within this diatom chain uh, that are shown in the green, uh, the green uh, um, labeling inside cells represents the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So this is a single cell view of, uh, of, of this interaction. Um, but in fact, the implications of this are enormous. Um, nitrogen fixation is incredibly important on land, um, in agriculture, um, and in forests and fields. Um, nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in symbiosis with plants um, can bring in a lot of atmospheric nitrogen uh, 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 convert it into a form that can be used by biology, uh, which can then be uh, be exploited by by the organisms that live in symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria such as rhizobium um, on, on on land. Now this process is at least as important in the ocean as it is on land, um, uh, but we know less about it because um, because these organisms are microscopic. So it's been more of a challenge to to, to figure out exactly the role of these different um, uh, of different nitrogen fixing symbioses um, at, at a global level uh, through uh, uh, through the kinds of approaches that we've had available before, but through the lens of Tyra Oceans by combining the genomics data set and the imaging data set, we can take all of these different organisms that we know um, fix nitrogen, the symbiotic associations um, in particular. And we can quantify them side by side. Uh, and here we see the six most important kinds of, uh, of nitrogen fixing um, uh, systems in the ocean um, that include single cell free living uh, uh, di uh, um, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria. We see their abundance on the, on the map here. Um, uh, uh, we also see single cell trichodesmium uh, bacteria, which live either in filaments in the ocean or as puffs or tufts, uh, which we can again quantify uh, uh, very nicely here. And we also have um, uh, symbiotic interactions, including diatom diazotroph associations, which we know quite a lot about. Uh, Ucin A uh, uh, and Crocosphera are worked on in particular by, by John Zaire in, uh, in Santa Cruz. And by combining this information, we can really see side by side uh, the relative importance of these different nitrogen fixing associations um, uh, that can help us explore uh, even better um, uh, nitrogen metabolism and in particular nitrogen fixation in, in, in the ocean. This work was done in collaboration with Rachel Foster in, in Stockholm uh, uh, and is a nice study of, of how you can combine genomics and imaging information to, to generate new, new information. So, um, enough about nitrogen. Um, let's turn to carbon. Um, let's turn to the biological carbon pump in, in the ocean. Um, here we have a view of photosynthesis from space, uh, uh, essentially detecting chlorophyll on, on the surface of our planet. Um, we've been able to do this now since um, uh, 40 years or so. Uh, so we have uh, pretty precise information about certainly surface photosynthesis. Um, from this, we have the realization that the oceans contribute as much photosynthesis. 
um, as do um, uh, the photosynthetic plants and the trees on land. Um, and also through this kind of imagery of the, of the earth, we also see the dynamics of, uh, of photosynthesis in the ocean as, as well. So studies from you know a um, century or more, um, in some cases, um, have told us about the uh, the importance of some of these photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. Um, uh, and on the one side, we have very small uh, prochlorococcus, cynicococcus. Uh, 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 prokaryotic um, uh, picocyanobacteria that contribute to photosynthesis, um, as well as trichodesmium filaments, which also do photosynthesis, as well as nitrogen fixation. And then on the eukaryotic side, uh, we know of green algae, dinoflagellates, uh, diatoms, um, uh, uh, haptophytes such as coccolithophores, uh, which we all uh, uh, appreciate the uh, the importance of these different groups for uh, for photosynthesis in the ocean, and then we are aware of different symbiotic again the importance of symbiosis between organisms, uh, symbiotic associations, uh, uh, which uh, uh, in, in in this case have an alga associating with an acantharia, uh, a zooplankton, uh, which again uh, uh, contributes to photosynthesis in in, in the ocean. Um, the question is, well, what are the relative contributions of these different groups? Um, here we can get a, a bit of a, a bird's eye view of that um, by looking at these different photosynthetic groups um, uh, and their distribution globally within the four different uh, eukaryotic size fractions that we have worked with in, in Tara. And what we see here quite clearly is we see the big three um, coming out that we expected to see. Uh, the dinoflagellates, um, the diatoms, and the haptophytes, including the coccolithophores. Okay, but we also see the importance of other groups that are less well studied, um, such as the clade seven prosinophytes, uh, the mam mamielophyce, uh, um, uh, um, uh, as well, such as Osteococcus, Micromonas, and so on. Uh, Dictyocophytes, the silicoflagellates, pelagophytes, uh, uh, and so on. So this gives us a view of the relative contributions of each of these organisms by looking at metabarcoding through analysis of the A18S sequence. Okay. What we can also do using this method is sort of look at the symbiotic associations as well and combine our, uh, our view of the photosynthetic organisms, which you've already seen, um, uh, with also the abundance of organisms that we know can form these symbioses um, with photosynthetic organisms. And you see over here uh, the, the really super dominance of, for example, radiolarians um, in the system, uh, uh, which are potentially then uh, um, uh, uh, looking to be extremely important in um, uh, contributing to photosynthesis in the ocean, although they have been largely overlooked. Um, so these groups, you've seen them before, the radiolarians um, uh, uh, evidence uh, through imaging. Um, these are silicified organisms like diatoms, make these beautiful structures, first drawn by um, Heckel, and some examples here. Other um, photosymbionts are uh, uh, foraminifera, here with, uh, um, with algae sitting on their spines. Um, these organisms are calcified. Um, and then we also have acantharia, which have um, exoskeletons made of strontium, um, it's one of the few organisms we know of on the planet that uses strontium as a mineral to build these uh, structures uh, uh, with uh, uh, endosymbionts, photosynthetic endosymbionts living inside the cell. So these uh, different groups appear to be um, uh, 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 perhaps more important than we, uh, than we thought of in the past. Um, what is also important when we're looking at photosynthesis is to try to compare what the uh, prokaryotic um, phytoplankton groups do compared with the eukaryotic phytoplankton groups. This has been a challenge because we don't have a unified molecular marker, uh, which allows us to see both prokaryotes and eukaryotes at the same time. But we think maybe we have developed one um, uh, in the form of PSBO. Um, a photosystem 2 gene present in all photosynthetic organisms, uh, uh, typically present as a single copy gene, um, uh, present 
in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, uh, uh, as long as they're photosynthetic. Um, and we think this may be, uh, in fact, a, a pretty useful universal marker uh, for photosynthetic organisms. And here we're using PSBO to compare, uh, on the one side, the abundance of the picocyanobacterial groups, Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, uh, together at the same time with the larger uh, eukaryotic phytoplankton, the diatoms are shown here, uh, the dinoflagellates are shown here. And here we can see the relative abundance of these different groups um, are uh, geographically. We see the diatoms dominating at the higher latitudes, uh, uh, for example. And we also see the diversity of these organisms uh, uh, through the Shannon index here, with the diversity typically richer in the, in the tropical regions, which I'll, I'll come back to um, a little bit later. Um, so this gives us a bird's eye view of which photosynthetic groups are perhaps doing photosynthesis in the ocean and their relative abundance, relative importance in different locations. Um, what we can also try to do is to, is to compare this data with actual data relating to photosynthetic activity. Um, and here in this heat map, we basically have uh, uh, the biology represented in the different organismal groups. Um, uh, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we have um, different environmental parameters with which we can, can, can relativize the abundance of these different organisms. Now, in terms of photosynthesis, the, rel the, the important parameters that we are showing here are NPP, net primary production, which is viewed from space, estimated from space, in these two uh, uh, rows here, and then we have chlorophyll measured either through fluorescence or by HPLC in the actual samples of the sampling sites. Okay, so what we can see in this plot is that the uh, this group here appear to have the uh, the most um, uh, strongest correlations with chlorophyll and with net primary production in uh, in the ocean. And this group of organisms here turns out to be the diatoms. Okay, so the diatoms appear to contribute the most to oceanic photosynthesis. Uh, through through this study, which is not necessarily a surprise, but it's reassuring to see uh, to see that pattern emerging from from this data set. So, photosynthesis is one half of the biological carbon pump, where uh, carbon dioxide is taken in from the atmosphere uh, and brought into the ocean interior to generate organic biomass. Um, the exit of the biological carbon pump, or one important. Um, exit from uh, the pump, at least geologically, is the sinking of this organic material um, down to the bottom of the ocean, uh, which ultimately generates the oil and the gas fossil fuels um, that we are burning so, so actively today. So this is a very slow process. Um, perhaps of, of the uh, uh, 40, 50 billion tons of organic carbon, um, that are brought into the ocean each year, perhaps only around 0.1% of that ultimately makes it into the sediments. Um, but by the you know, huge reserves that we have of oil and, and gas fossil fuels, we can see the importance of this process over, over geological time. Um, now we have rudimentary views of, of how this works. Um, uh, you know, the uptake of CO2 through photosynthesis, um, uh, its transfer into uh, the, the food webs in the ocean, uh, uh, deposition uh, sinking in the ocean through fecal pellets, uh, uh, through death of organisms and so on. But uh, we thought in our oceans that we could go a step further by uh, seeing which organisms uh, perhaps most strongly associated with um, carbon flux in the water column. Um, now, this is possible because on the one side, we measured a uh, 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 flux of carbon in the ocean um, using uh, by, by measuring uh, particles in the ocean down to 500 meters. Uh, so this is a map of sort of carbon particles, particles in the ocean uh, throughout the Tyra ex expedition down to 500 meters. You see it's not at all uh, homogeneous, but there are some sites with a lot of carbon flux uh, there are other sites with very little. Uh, we can take this data and we can combine this with our interactome data and see if we can identify organisms 
that are particularly associated with um, strong carbon export. And so this allows us to go from this rather you know, rudimentary view of plankton ecosystems to a more graph-based view where we can pinpoint particular organisms um, that appear to be particularly important in uh, being associated with strong carbon export activity. So sort of identifying hubs uh, uh, organism hubs which uh, are critical to the functioning of the entire network. Um, this led us to certain organisms including radiolarians and dinoflagellates which we were not necessarily surprised to find uh, but also led us to the importance of Sinecococcus, so one of these picocyanobacteria, uh, together with the viruses um, that attack Sinecococcus, uh, known as Sinecophages. So implying that even these, this one of these very small components of the ecosystem can have ultimately uh, a very large impact on the sinking of carbon material down to the bottom of the ocean, um, which was quite a surprise to find that, uh, uh, that, that result from, from this data. So this is sort of what you can do when you use sort of machine learning based approaches to, to interrogate very important biogeochemical processes um, and try to associate organisms with those um, biogeochemical processes. Let me move away from biogeochemistry and, and um, focus on ecology of, of marine ecosystems uh, more specifically. Um, so really asking the question uh, simply, um, are plankton communities geographically structured? Um, and if so, why? Um, you might think that with all of the ocean circulation, the currents and so on that are, that are so dynamic that there may be no um, um, uh, structure in these ecosystem communities. Um, and we don't really have a lot of evidence from them uh, from the past, but by contrast on land, we know uh, of these very, very strong um, biodiversity patterns. Um, one of which is known as latitudinal diversity gradients um, uh, on, on, on land. These patterns were first observed by Alexander von Humboldt uh, more than two centuries ago. Um, and, and he noted, uh, for example, when, when climbing mountains or climbing volcanoes in different regions of the world, um, he noted that the nearer we approach the tropics, uh, the greater the increase in the variety of structure, the greater form, mixture of colors as also in perpetual youth and vigor of organic um, life. Uh, so uh, of course we don't sadly use that sort of language in our scientific uh, articles these days, but it gives you the idea of, uh, of, of how we found these, uh, the importance of these patterns in diversity. Um, and so we now know this as the latitudinal gradient of species diversity. Um, it increases from the poles to the equator and is maximal in the tropics. So you basically have this line of species richness going from uh, tropical regions up to the polar regions as we increase in, in absolute latitude. Um, these gradients have been found universally on land um, for birds, for reptiles, for amphibians and so on. And they've also been found in soil microbes. Uh, so even though they're microbes living in soil, uh, they also appear to display these latitudinal gradients as well. Question is, in the ocean, um, we, we don't really know um, whether these gradients may exist in the ocean. Uh, there's been some contrasting data in the past. Um, on the one hand, uh, Jed Furman uh, did find evidence for latitudinal gradient of marine bacteria in his study, um, whereas the more recent study from Anya Waite and Eric Race um, uh, in a transect in the South Pacific um, did not find any strong evidence for a latitudinal gradient. Um, so we thought with our, with our global data set collected uniformly um, uh, at multiple sites, we could try it and address this using Tara Ocean's data. Um, so this is what we did. Um, this is using the, the molecular data um, for the different groups of organisms in the plankton, um, the different eukaryotic groups, um, be it photosynthetic or, or heterotrophic. Um, the prokaryotic groups, again, photosynthetic groups or heterotrophic groups or archaea, and different classes of viruses that are also shown here. 
And we have grouped this data, which is molecular data uh, derived from different sources uh, uh, over this latitudinal gradient, okay, going from the Arctic through the tropics down to the Southern Ocean. And we see that by and large, yes, we do see these latitudinal diversity gradients for the grand majority of, of these organisms, although we do not see it for the viruses in particular, uh, the bacteriophages, which are the viruses that infect the bacteria. So we see by and large these latitudinal gradients reflect sort of the temperature uh, uh, that we uh, uh, observe in the ocean. Um, however, the patterns are still quite uh, a bit more complicated than just temperature. Um, so if we go beyond temperature and look at sort of chlorophyll levels um, in the ocean, we look at seasonality uh, in the ocean shown in blue here. Um, we see that these patterns have different uh, uh, relations to these different uh, groups of organisms, okay? So essentially showing that these latitudinal gradients of diversity um, display different patterns with respect to environmental parameters. And it's not just a question of, um, uh, of temperature, um, which we might perhaps have expected to find. Um, we also reiterated these patterns uh, using imaging data, uh, looking at morphology of organisms. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll perhaps skip that. Um, and I'll perhaps skip the deep ocean and go to um, uh, uh, the, the, the broader patterns that we can make for at least six of these different groups that we were looking at. Um, so here we used a modeling approach um, called general additive models um, to take this actual data from Tara Oceans and extrapolate it out to the global ocean um, uh, 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 which work quite well, at least for these six groups. So here we have photosynthetic bacteria, the picocyanobacteria. Here we have the uh, uh, photosymbionts that I talked to you about before. Here we have the photosynthetic uh, 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 groups of eukaryotes, um, like the diatoms, dinoflagellates, and so on. And here we have the copepods, uh, a group of zooplankton. And in each case, we can see this gradient of diversity being uh, uh, um, highest in the tropical regions and tapering off as we go to the uh, higher latitudes. But in each case, these patterns are, are, are slightly different. But nonetheless, this gives us a sort of starting point um, to then um, uh, use this data and, and ask, well, how may this diversity of these different groups be affected uh, by climate change as we move forward in, in the future ocean. Um, so to do, to analyze this, we took the model outputs um, from the IPCC, in particular the CMIP-5 uh, model outputs, which predict sea surface temperature change uh, amongst other parameters up to the year 2100, so the end of this century. Um, on the left, we see these projected sea surface temperature changes. Um, in the ocean. And on the right, we see the projected changes in primary production um, uh, as, as, as well. So since we found that in our gradients, temperature and productivity were the two principal components determining the, uh, the distribution of these species, we then used, we then put these uh, uh, organisms into this projected future ocean and determine uh, potential anomalies projected anomalies um, uh, that, that may occur um, in the coming decades. Um, and here we have plotted out those anomalies in biodiversity for these different groups of organisms on, on the maps uh, on the top. So for example, for the copepods, we can see uh, projected decreases in diversity in the lower regions, in the lower latitude regions, and uh, um, uh, um, projected increases in diversity at the higher latitudes, uh, uh, for example, in the Arctic, okay, as the ice melts. Um, so uh, with this data, uh, uh, we can plot this out in latitude, uh, on latitudinal bands for these six different groups, which is shown here, showing the projected anomalies uh, at the end of the 21st century. And we can see that these projected changes um, uh, are perhaps going to have quite some impact on very important um, processes in the ocean. Uh, uh, for example, here, uh, related to carbon exports, um, related to fish catch, 
in the fishing industry, essentially, the activity of fishing industry by latitude and the density here of marine protected areas. You maybe have difficulty to appreciate these through a uh, um, latitudinal plot. So here are these three parameters um, shown um, uh, geographically, carbon export in the ocean, um, uh, annual fish landings um, shown here, and the density of marine protected areas uh, shown on the right. Um, and on the left, we have these projected diversity anomalies for the different plankton groups. And we can see that, you know, a lot of these projected diversity anomalies are perhaps going to impact these high latitude regions where we have uh, uh, very important activities biogeochemically in terms of carbon export, um, from an industrial perspective in terms of fish catch, fish landings, and from conservation um, uh, uh, aspects uh, uh, concerning the density of marine protected areas which are regions where we try to protect the diversity of these organisms in the first place. Okay, so basically this tells us that we have to take these um, uh, observations in, in hand and try to uh, consider what impact they may have on our, on our future ocean. Um, so that is a summary of that work, which, which we published um, last year, basically showing that, um, yes, we can um, uh, pick up latitudinal diversity gradients for all types of plankton, but we did, do not see it in the deep ocean. I didn't show you that. Uh, and we do not see it for the bacteriophages, the viruses which infect uh, bacteria, which are curious. Um, we see that the diversity correlates with temperature uh, uh, and with uh, chlorophyll, but it's not unimodal with respect to chlorophyll, which is why it's important to compare it with um, productivity. Um, and we see that the changes in plankton diversity uh, are likely to um, uh, be of imp uh, are likely to impact the functioning of the ocean um, in in future decades. Okay, Al although the processes, um, the consequences are uncertain. So that was the last part of the talk. Um, in general, then, what I tried to show you um, is summarised in this uh, uh, in, in this slide here. So, I think the the value of, of Tara Oceans, um, first of all. Is that it, it is the truly it is truly the first end-to-end -end description of a continuous global ecosystem. We don't really have other examples yet uh, for for that sort of level of of a fine level of description at a global level. Um, concerning the uh, prokaryotic component of the ocean, um, we have about thirty-five thousand um, taxa bacteria, which are in fact mostly known. Um, containing around 40 million genes, which are mostly unknown. A lot of work to do to figure out what they do. Um, uh, uh, we have seen that the diversity of eukaryotic plankton is huge at around 130,000 taxa, uh, defined by sequence information. Um, uh, uh, and that around 90% of these are new, and that there is a considerable unknown component again. Um, and then for the viral communities, we have um, described around 200,000 different kinds of viruses. Again, more than 99% are new here. Um, we've looked at the plankton interactome, uh, which reveals the importance of uh, organism-organism interaction, interactions. Um, and I've shown you how machine learning approaches can be used to identify taxa associated with particular processes, uh, giving the example of the biological carbon pump. Um, and I've tried to show you how we can use microscopy with the genomics information to explore more about these uh, microscopic environments. Um, and then finally, I talked to you about the latitudinal diversity gradients, which we cover. And then finally, in the last perhaps couple of minutes, let me just um, reinforce the fact that all of this data are public um, and are available for anybody interested to use. Um, this, um, this slide really, um, uh, I think, nicely uh, illustrates the, the significant data reach of Tara Ocean's data, um, thanks to the fact that, that it is publicly available information. So on the one hand, um, all of the data that we generated from, um, from uh, these microscopic plankton communities um, have been deposited in the European Nucleotide Archive, 
um, at EBI. So that concerns the genomic information, and that opens up, you know, a whole world of possibilities to explore uh, what is in, what is present in this data set. Um, and then all of the images uh, that we have generated are equally um, available through different archives going from um, uh, Eurobioimaging through to OBIS, uh, through Ecotaxa, again, which are great platforms for exploration of, of this data set. And then uh, 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 we are also able to link this data out more, even more globally through important initiatives such as eModNet, CDataNet, Copernicus, and so on, which again brings in, with, with allows us to bring in the oceanographic uh, uh, components to, to better address um, uh, links between the biology of these organisms and their biogeochemical uh, functions, for example, in, in, in the ocean. Um, our colleagues in Marseille have generated a, a wonderful resource called the Ocean Gene Atlas. Um, there is a nucle nucleic acids research paper describing it. Um, this is uh, sort of a, a, like a Google, uh, if you like, to, to go and explore our ocean data. Um, uh, the Ocean Gene Atlas allows you to go in with a keyword or with a DNA sequence. Um, uh, and pull out all of the sequences that are found in Tara Oceans. So you can look at the geographical distribution of your favorite gene. You can look at the environmental context with respect to nitrate, with respect to silicate, with respect to temperature and so on. And you can also look at the taxonomic distribution of your favorite gene uh, to see where it is found in, in different organisms. Um, most more recently, our colleagues in, in Marseille have also generated the Ocean Barcode Atlas where you can do exactly the same sorts of interrogations, but using the, the 18S barcode data, uh, which allows you to explore community ecology, uh, 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 for example, through sequence-based queries uh, to see, uh, uh, to get information about the uh, uh, particular organisms that, that you may be interested to explore. And thanks to this and um, um, this sort of resource and the public availability of the Tara Oceans data. We've already seen, in fact, a lot of uh, um, seminal papers coming from other groups, um, nothing to do with Tara Oceans Consortium, who have uh, made, I think, uh, potentially very uh, uh, significant findings uh, 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 based on our data set. So in, in one paper here from Tess Etema's group, um, uh, they, they found what they considered to be a better candidate for the origin of mitochondria and eukaryotes uh, um, uh, within one of the um, uh, 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 one of the uh, proteobacterial groups um, that is described in Tara Oceans data from the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. So that's a pretty profound uh, finding. Um, our data has also been used to generate estimates of biomass distribution on Earth, which I think we can all appreciate is kind of important. Um, and then we have seen uh, uh, additional surprises, um, uh, evidence for huge uh, bacteriophages in our data set from Jill Banfield's group, um, and even new CRISPR-Cas9 systems uh, uh, from these huge phages, uh, which can potentially be used as new genome editing uh, tools, uh, uh, again, in these marine uh, bacteria. Uh, that came out from Jennifer Dudner's group, who got the Nobel Prize last year for CRISPR-Cas9, of course. And then finally, there are new forms of rhodopsins that have been discovered in these marine organisms, uh, uh, which can be uh, potentially very useful for um, uh, optogenetics-based approaches. Um, which are incredibly important, uh, for example, for, deter for, for exploring brain function um, in, in animals, uh, yeah. including ourselves. So these are examples of some of the discoveries uh, that have been enabled by Tara Ocean's data. Um, and, and then we are also participating in several ocean observatory initiatives to try to bring genomics methods and imaging methods into, um, into marine observation through biogeoscapes, which is a continuation of geotracers through the Glomicon initiative of Pierluigi Boutillier, through the Atlantico uh, European project and the and the MBON Marine Biodiversity Observation. Another for the asylum. Um, so all of that, uh, um, uh, I will end here and just 
show that you know basically this data can be used at different levels uh, to explore um, the basic you know molecular cellular processes in all domains of life and beyond you know the Arabidopsis, the mouse, the Drosophila, canonical model organisms um, can be used to explore fundamental ecological and evolutionary principles and can be used to explore this interface between marine ecosystems and the functioning of the earth system through biogeochemical processes and so on. So um, uh, uh, in closing, let me thank uh, the wide group of people who have participated in this project. Um, uh, we're about 20 labs involved in this work. Um, uh, uh, and here I also note our um, uh, funders of the research uh, and also our uh, sponsors as well who have uh, participated to make this project happen uh, 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 in the first place. So thank you to all of them for their participation and thank you to you for your um, for listening and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Chris. This was very impressive. I, I have uh, I, there's several questions actually already in the chat. But I have a basic one. Uh, this is uh, so you mentioned all these new, uh, new species, new groups, um, and of course this is based on sequencing. I presume all of these were mixed up. How problematic was the assembly of these genomes? Because of course there may, may be a you know, can you get some kind of hybrids and stuff? I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think that's very much a, a work in progress, Adelino. Um, um, we have more and more um, uh, genome assemblies coming out of the um, of the of the Tara Oceans data. On on the one hand, um, the single cell based approaches um, allow you to generate a um, genome assembly from a single cell, um, so you can be fairly conf confident that that. Um, genome assembly does represent the organism that you were looking at in the first place. Um, uh, however, those genome assemblies tend to be, you know, 50, 60 percent complete or so, yeah, yeah. missing a lot of information. Um, on the other hand, uh, what uh, what is happening more and more is that people are deriving um, uh, genome assemblies from the metagenome information. So based on uh, based on overlap of sequence, based on um, uh, uh, nucleotide frequencies and sequences, based on relative abundances. And um, so these are called MAGs, uh, metagenome assembled genomes. Um, we have several thousand now coming out of Tara Oceans. Um, I forgot to mention that they uh, are also available, um, in particular for Meran's group at the University of Chicago. Uh, together with Tom Delmont, they have generated, um, uh, uh, I think, around a thousand mags from prokaryotes, um, and now have uh, generated several hundred mags from eukaryotes. Um, there's a bioarchive paper describing that. So these are composite sequences. We cannot say that they are a sequence uh, from a single cell, of course. Um, and we cannot necessarily be sure that they are sequences uh, from a single species, a single taxa. Um, uh, so, so these whole genome assemblies are, are likely to be, you know, representative of um, of a collection of different uh, different um, coming from a collection of different cells, um, which may or may not be, uh, for example, of the same species, depending on the diversity. Of a particular group of group of organisms, um, so they're very useful. Um, they're very very useful resource, um, which I think, by and large, we can probably say that these are representing species at the species level. Uh, but we do need some uh, caution in um, uh, in interrogating those genome assemblies coming from metagenomes. Hey, thank you. So uh, there's a first question here in the chat is from Miguel Santos. Uh, I think you have already answered, but I'll let him uh, say, you know, ask the question. He may want to know something else. Miguel. Okay. No, no, it's it's okay. I I think he already Chris already asked. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nick Nicholas Pate uh, has a question. 
Thank you for a really interesting talk, Chris. I really enjoyed that. And it was nice to see a, a good overview of, of Tara. I, I really enjoyed it. My question is really about, um, you know, you, you've raised a lot of, of new fundamental information from plankton. And my question really is how much is these new discoveries already been worked on being integrated into oceanographic modeling and, and forecasting? And are you guys involved with any of this? Because it seems this would be adding quite a lot of new and very important information to any models that are existing. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a very important question to um, uh, to, to try to um, uh, uh, integrate some of this new information into biogeochemical models, into ecosystem models um, uh, 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 um, of, of, um, of of the ocean. Um, and of, of, uh, of marine ecosystems, um, it is it, it it is still very much a challenge in most cases. I mean, we are we are working with modelers to to try to address that, um, in particular through these initiatives of um, uh, global marine ocean observation, um, biogeoscape, Glomicon, Atlantico, and Embon. Um, we are, we are working actively on this, but it, it, it remains very much a work in progress and. You know, the, the, the basic problem is that these biogeochemical, for example, and climate models are already extremely complex. Um, they're using, you know, some of the most powerful computers in the world to, 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 to turn. Uh, they're already very complex. Um, uh, on the other hand, we have all of this genomic information. You know, which is which is incredibly complex as well. Um, terra terra bases uh, means terabytes of information, um, and and so we have to figure out how to marry these two worlds of of uh, very very large data sets to make them talk to each other. Um, uh, uh, we don't have a we don't have clear solutions yet, um, uh, but there are several initiatives. There are several papers that have been published that. That sort of do help pave the way. That you know, sort of propose like um, um, uh, key genes, uh, sentinel genes or sentinel species, uh, which can be used, for example, to to um, to assess temperature uh, or to assess other biogeochemical uh, uh, features, processes in the ocean, um, and and so through these sorts of approaches of trying to identify key genes or key taxa. Uh, uh, um, that is perhaps one um, one entry point into uh, um, uh, the the modelling initiatives that have been that have been performed at the moment. Um, but there is a lot of work going on, and, and there are already some uh, very important, interesting papers that have been that have been um, that have emerged from that from that work. Um, uh, I can maybe cite this paper from uh, Stylianas Luca and Mikel Dobli. Uh, who's basically uh, in in this paper, which was published in Science um, four years or so ago? Um, they were basically proposing to move away from a taxonomic view of uh, of, of, of planktonic e ecosystems towards a functional view, uh, uh, where we're looking at you know the 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 abundance of key genes and key processes, uh, be it nitrogen cycling, bit carbon cycling and so on. So these are ways that people are trying to address this um, this challenge. Um, it remains a challenge, but we're, but we're definitely getting there thanks to some great work being done by multiple groups. Thank you. So Thank you, Chris. Maria Rita Caracciolo also got a, a question. Hello. Thank you, Chris, for this amazing presentation. Hi. It's a very impressive work. I also analyze metabarcoding uh, um, in a little station in the Western English Channel from uh, Somlita Stan. And so I was wondering how this big work that is done at planetary scale and that is a distribution work can relate with the time, with the temporal patterns of the organism. Because when you talk about most abundant, most diverse, I become very skeptic because me, I find every month a different most abundant and a different most diverse because it changed mm -hmm. months to months. So I was wondering yeah. how you can relate this before to this. Yeah, Thank absolutely. I, I, I think um, uh, Tara Oceans is very good for looking at large scale uh, spatial patterns of, uh, of plankton diversity. 
uh, uh, but temporal patterns are much more difficult because we didn't do any longitudinal sampling. Um, you know, we went to a sampling site, we stayed on site for 48 hours, we did our sampling and we moved on to the next site. Um, so we don't have good uh, temporal resolution at all in, in, in our data set. Um, um, uh, this can be helped um, on the one hand, um, because um, uh, we did, well, the Genoscope did very, very, very deep sequencing of each sample. So we have, um, uh, so the rare biosphere of organisms is very well documented in, um, in each um, uh, sample site. Um, so in principle, if an organism becomes dominant uh, two weeks later, one month later, uh, it is perhaps already represented in our rare tail of, uh, of uh, in our tail of, uh, of, of rare organisms in a sample. Um, and because we did so, so deep sampling uh, sequence, I'm sorry, because we did such deep sequencing, uh, uh, I think we do have pretty good um, uh, uh, saturation of the sequence diversity in in the ocean. Um, so that maybe helps on one side. Um, on the other on the other side, um, what we also endeavoured to do whenever we could was to sample um, at locations where uh, there are uh, that there is longitudinal sampling. Time series sites such as um, Station Aloha in Hawaii, uh, the BAT site in Bermuda, um, uh, the site in the Azores, um, um, the Marikiara site in Naples. Um, we sample there. So these, these, this potentially allows to couple the, the Tara Oceans observations uh, that we made with the longitudinal data sets that are generated uh, by the people who run those stations. So. So those are a few answers for you. They're not perfect answers, and I agree that that is very much a limitation in our data set. Um, uh, but they are some aspects which maybe help to uh, uh, worth thinking about. Okay, and then Mariana has got a, a very specific question. Mariana. Um, uh, so good morning. Um, good morning. First of all, thank you, Chris, for your very uh, impressive presentation. I really enjoyed. So thanks a lot. And sorry if my question going goes a bit over from the argument of the presentation. But I mean, uh, we talked about uh, uh, forecasts about climate change and the massive biological pump uh, uh, from phytoplankton abundance. And so I want to ask you um, maybe uh, is little. Uh, difficult to address to this question, but maybe new knowledge from Tara expeditions about uh, planktonic uh, community assemblages in the oceans can uh, support or not experiment about uh, um, ocean fertilization by iron. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, about uh, um, triggering uh, blooms uh, to mitigate climate change. And uh, since this uh, um, ocean engineering is uh, really debated, uh, and uh, I mean, there are a lot of challenges, challenges due to the complexity of the oceanic system. I don't know, maybe Tara Oceans can provide uh, information to support or not the, I mean, about trying this engineering to uh, try to mitigate the global warming mm -hmm. by the biological pump. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we can really add much to the, uh, um, to the debate over ocean fertilization um, uh, using iron. Um, we have worked on iron um, uh, at, at some sites in the Pacific. Um, uh, because we've been able to um, compare plankton communities over uh, gradients of bioavailable iron. Um, so we've been able to, to, to look at how uh, plankton communities perhaps respond to increased um, iron bioavailability in the environment. Um, that doesn't really help us address the basic question of ocean fertilization 
approaches you to using iron, which are aimed at um, um, uh, um, sinking that carbon to the deep to the deep ocean to get it out of the carbon cycle through following its um, uh, um, following its um, uh, accumulation in the in the food web. Um, uh, uh, we are really not able to address that um, because we didn't do any. Um, sampling using, for example, uh, sediment traps. So everything, everything on Tara that we did was focused on the top 1,000 meters, and in particular on the photic zone, the top 100 meters or so. So we don't really know how the the, the plankton that we found in the surface ocean, how it relates to the plankton that that, that sediment that sink um, uh, through the process of the carbon pump. Um, because we're not able to deploy sediment traps on a small vessel such as Tara. So we don't really know, uh, you know, through our, our work on the uh, biological carbon pump that I showed you um, uh, that was um, uh, associating plankton communities with, um, with the activity of the biological carbon pump. Um, uh, this work that was led by Lionel Guidi, I should acknowledge, um, from Villefranche, um, what this is, is a correlation between uh, different kinds of plankton that we see in the surface ocean and the activity of the, uh, of, uh, of, um, and, and the am amount of particles in the water column. We, it, it does not mean that those organisms that we found are actually those organisms that are sinking to the bottom. It just means that we have an association between mm -hmm. what we find in the surface with the particles that we found find deeper down, so we cannot really. I, I don't think there's much that we um, that we have generated that can be of use to address whether ocean fertilization can be effective or or, or not. Um, I think we need other other approaches. We need you know more experiment experimentation to see how um, uh, iron influences um, uh, planktonic communities and how the carbon that is um, incorporated into those communities can can be sequestered to the deep ocean through iron fertilization approaches, which we haven't addressed at all, I think, in, in our study. So I can't really say very much about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. My question was, uh, I mean, about uh, not so correlated anyway. So thanks a lot uh, for your work. Okay, uh, now it's Vibe, Vibe Questra. Hello, Viva. Hi, Chris. Uh, that was, of course, a great talk, needless to say. But uh, uh, my question is about uh, the uh, Tara Oceans expedition future. So uh, they, these expeditions, were one or a few of their kinds. But of course, uh, they are very expensive. And uh, you cannot reach every single place in the uh, ocean at all times. So time series is a little bit difficult. But I think what we now need is a more uh, denser coverage and also time series of different places uh, of the ocean to make it all less anecdotal what uh, is being find, found. So my question is, in how far can you scale down a Tara expedition by letting things that are now done by people be done by robots and machines on board of a sophisticated floater or uh, ocean-going robot, and then let that thing deliver once in a while the data or the samples in uh, collection stations, and then off they wander off into the ocean to do their things. And uh, so what is then happening? Because if you look at Tara, Tara, the people on board complaining might be about the uh, fact that there is not so much space. But if you look in the Tara ship, most of the space is occupied by people and their necessities. And if you could throw the people off, then you have some machines and they don't complain about uh, not having a bathroom on board and not having a shower all the time and not having a cook and food and that sort of things. Yeah, um, great, great question. I, I, I think we are definitely going in that direction. Um, 
Um, and we're going pretty fast. I think, you know, over the next uh, um, couple of decades, we will see some remarkable progress in, uh, in, in that sort of, uh, in that sort of direction. Um, on the one side, you know, we have um, uh, these very small DNA sequencing machines um, uh, 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 from Oxford nan Nanopore that, you know, the size of USB keys, which, you know, permit sequencing to be done on board a ship. Uh, in fact, we're already doing that on Tara. This is a game changer because you can collect a sample in the morning, uh, you can do the sequencing, and you can have a result by the evening uh, which can then influence your sampling the day after, for example. Um, so you're doing sort of real-time um, oceanography. Um, I think that can be a game changer. Um, and other sorts of equipment are getting more and more miniaturized um, as well. So we're seeing, yes, the capacity to to pack more to, to pack more instruments onto a small research platform. And uh, uh, steadily, we're also seeing the automation of certain um, uh, measurements. Um, and we are seeing, you know, the more and more examples of autonomous vessels going out. Um, um, I know there's a vessel between uh, the UK and, and the US um, that is an autonomous, um, uh, forget if it's a sailboat or, uh, or motor driven, exclusively uh but you know that it's an autonomous uh ship that they're trying to to get to new york and these are game-changing technologies which yes i think will potentially make um uh, oceanography uh, very different in the future as well by having autonomous vessels be they um more more ships or boats or, or floats buoys um i think we'll see more and more of that as automation um, uh, increases and miniaturization increases. Um, I'm sure uh, we will see, um, you know, like uh, technologies like based on Argo floats um, uh, 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 um, incorporating DNA sequencing um, uh, in the coming decade. So we will have Argo floats that are sequencing DNA directly in the water column, uh, coming up to the surface, transmitting that DNA sequence to the satellite back to us in our nice warm uh, laboratories to analyze. Uh, I'm sure these things are gonna happen uh, sooner rather than later, but you know the challenges are quite enormous, of course, um, uh, relating to the technology that has to be in the water, you know, sequencing DNA um, in a, saline environment like the ocean um, uh, has its challenges to separate the reactions from the environment. Um, uh, beaming up such a huge amount of data from an Argo float to a satellite and getting it to the labs is still uh, um, uh, technologically very, very challenging. It's one thing sending, you know, salinity uh, temperature data with a float. It's another sending, you know, gigabytes of DNA sequence information. So we're not quite there yet, but these things will happen more and more. I'm, I'm quite convinced um, the technology is getting uh, 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 better and better. Um, and then on the other side, perhaps we will see um, uh, uh, more and more initiatives around citizen science um, or citizen sailors. You know, there's, uh, uh, there are many thousands of sailors at sea at any one time and uh, plugging into that network uh, uh, is again something that is interesting to to help us uh, collect data from from the environment um, in the future. So, I, uh, hopefully, we will see different initiatives taking place in the next uh, quite soon. In fact, uh, in the next decade or two, related to exactly what you what you were asking, Viva. Okay, just one final question from Maria Rita quick one. Yeah, it's related to the beginning of your presentation when you say that you're also working uh, to influence policy. So I was wondering if there are ongoing projects uh, with the collaboration with poli policy makers or uh, all this kind of projects. Yeah, well, we're, we're pretty active in the uh, within the UN decade of ocean science. Um, that is an important platform to 
to move the science into the policy arena. Arena, um, we we have to, um, and, and there are other initiatives. Um, uh, um, for example, the the Ocean and Climate Platform, um, uh, which attempts to, you know, to promote a science based view. Um, uh, 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 based on current knowledge to influence um, uh, policy in the ocean. Um, uh, this can go from, you know, um, influencing like um, sampling authorizations in the high seas to not make it too, uh, too difficult to get sampling authorizations um, uh, uh, through to, you know, protection of the ocean in, in different ways. Um, I think there's there's a lot of things uh, happening, but we really have to increase the efficiency of these of these of the interface between science and um, and policymakers and governance. Um, you know, we see with the with the COVID uh, pandemic that even when human lives are at stake um, and there are huge social um, upheaval because of COVID, we see that. The politicians are generally been pretty incapable of trans transferring scientific knowledge into policy. So even when it's a health issue, it's um, the inefficiency of the system is very clear. So we have to we have to improve that. Um, we really have to improve that. You know, you can imagine when it's when it's something like climate change uh, that the, that the politicians are going to be even slower to respond to the calls from from the scientists that things have to be done. Um, so I think there's really, really something major has to happen there um, uh, uh, very soon um, to 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 improve that. We obviously have to do that on our side. As scientists, we have to improve that, um, but the politicians also have to become more aware of that and, and come towards us as well. So that's, that's a big challenge for the immediate future. Also to increase information between uh, young researchers that would like to do this, for example, to work for filling this gap between policy and uh, science. Personally, I don't know a lot of uh, corporations that work on this. I know the European Marine Board for example, but then if in the future I want to look for a job on this, for example, I would not know where to go look for. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, information. yeah, one, one of the problems, I think, um, the unfortunate problems is that um, for scientists like us to go into policy, um, uh, you are often considered as a failed scientist. It's sort of considered like a stigma that you're not good enough to become a real scientist, so you go into policy. And that has to completely change, I think. Um, you know, we have to really look at these people who have a scientific background, who make that decision to go into policy uh, as, as, as leading figures uh, that, we, um, uh, that, that we support uh, 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 as well. And that's so I think that's also a social um, aspect that we need to overcome um, uh, from our from our side as scientists. We need to acknowledge the important work of these people um, uh, much more than we than we have done in the past. Um, yeah, well, I think so, this is yeah. a very good reflection. I have a suggestion: uh, when people are fifty, well, let's say sixty years old, they should not get any more funding, and they should go into policy. How about that? I'm, I'm already on the line for that. So yeah. um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, this was really uh, very impressive and, and I think very enlightening. You know, uh, in fact, we, we you know, one, one of the, my first contacts with this kind of science, big science, uh, was in the Marine Genomics Europe uh, Network of Excellence. And that opened my eyes. And of course, you can see, you know, sometimes it looks very distant, but the, the impact of this uh, kind of project is, is enormous, as you can see from just from this slide. So this is really very good. And I'm really glad that you accepted to give this talk. Uh, I think everyone enjoyed it and uh, it will be recorded so uh, people can, can look at it. And, um, and of course, we're going to have, uh, you know, maybe invite you for the next one next year. Uh, so that you sure. can give us some more ideas. 
Uh, thank you very much, everyone. In half an hour will be uh, for the presentations on the marine stations. And so see you then. Thank you, everyone, for listening. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. <laughs>